We're going to go through three examples of finding the absolute extrema of a function on a closed interval. To do this, we will need to consider critical numbers, and we will need this theorem, which we proved in a previous lesson. I'll leave a link to that in the description. The theorem tells us that any relative mins or maxes of a function have to occur at critical numbers. Relative mins or maxes occur at critical numbers. And remember that a critical number of a function is just a point where the derivative is zero or the derivative is undefined. Then this theorem gives us a fairly straightforward process for finding absolute extrema on closed intervals. And that process is laid out here. So if we're trying to find the extrema of a continuous function on a closed interval from A to B, we have to begin by finding the critical numbers of the function inside the interval, and then evaluate the function at all of those values. Just because we have a critical number, that doesn't mean that the function has a max or a min there. We have to check those values and compare them to each other, see which one's biggest, see which one's smallest. But those aren't the only points we have to check. Relative mins and relative max by definition are in the interior of a function's domain. So if we have a function on a closed interval, we also need to be sure to check the ends of the domain. So we need to evaluate the function at the endpoints, A and B, because the relative max and min won't include A and B. Those can't be relative maxes or mins by definition, but they certainly could be absolute maximums and absolute minimums. So we need to check the endpoints too. Once we've evaluated the function at all the critical points and all the endpoints, just find which one's smallest, that's gonna be the minimum. Find which one's biggest, that'll be the maximum. Let's get into the examples. Here is our first problem. We want to find the extreme values of f of x equals three x to the fourth minus four x cubed on the interval from negative one to two. Let's begin by finding the critical numbers of the function. To do that, we need to find where the derivative is zero and where the derivative does not exist. So let's begin by taking the derivative. f prime of x can be found by applying the power rule. Fairly straightforward derivative here. So 3x to the fourth becomes 12x cubed, and minus 4x cubed becomes minus 12x squared. Now we can see this is just a straightforward polynomial. There's not going to be a value of x where this doesn't exist. So the only critical numbers are going to be where this guy is equal to zero. To figure out where that is, we can factor out two factors of x. So we're saying that we will set this equal to zero. We're trying to find the critical numbers, so we're trying to find where this derivative equals zero. And to that end, we'll factor out an x squared. That's gonna leave 12x right there, and then minus 12. So we just factored out that x squared. This, of course, equals zero. Then we can apply the zero product property. We know that either x squared equals zero or this other factor, 12x minus 12 equals zero. So x squared equaling zero would give us x equals zero as our first critical point. And the other possibility that 12x minus 12 equals zero, well, that would mean that 12x equals 12. And so x equals one is the other critical point. So these are the two critical points. Now we can evaluate the function at these points. If we plug in zero, we just get three times zero to the four minus four times zero to the third. That's just zero. Then evaluating the function at the other critical point, which is one, that would just be three minus four, which is negative one. All right. Now remember, we've got to check what the function equals at the endpoints of the interval. So next we'll plug in the left endpoint, negative one. F of negative one is three minus negative four. So that's three plus four, which is seven. And then finally, we'll evaluate the function at the right endpoint, which is two. And that's going to give us 
3 multiplied by 2 to the 4, 2 to the 4 is 16, so this is 48. And then we need to subtract 4 times 2 cubed, that's 4 times 8, which is 32. So we have 48 minus 32, and so that's going to be 16. And remember, we need to check the endpoints of the domain because we're looking for absolute extreme values. The local extreme values, which the critical points can help us locate, by definition, have to exist in the interior of the domain. So we need to make sure that we check the endpoints separately. Now that we've checked all the possible candidates for the absolute extreme values, we've checked the critical points, and we've checked the endpoints, we can just find the smallest, that's the minimum, find the biggest, that's the max. So we would say that our function has a minimum of negative 1 at x equals 1. That's the absolute minimum of this function on this interval. And the function has a maximum of 16 at x equals 2. All right, let's move on to the next example. We want to find the extrema of f of x equals 2x minus 3x to the 2 thirds on the interval from negative 1 to 3. We'll begin by finding the critical points. So we'll take the derivative and set it equal to 0. Again, the derivative of this function is just a simple application of the power rule. 2x will become 2 and 3x to the 2 thirds, applying the power rule to that, is going to give us minus, don't forget the minus, minus 2x to the negative one third. Now we want to consider where this doesn't exist and we also want to find where it equals zero. Okay, so once we set this equal to zero, it might be helpful to separate the constant from our variable. So let's add two x to the negative third to both sides. That will give us that two equals two times x to the negative third. And then we can divide everything by two to get that one equals x to the negative third. So when is this equation going to be true? Well, the only time this is gonna be true is when x is equal to one. 1 is the only number that when you raise it to the power of negative 1 third, you get 1. So one of our critical points is at x equals 1. That is, in fact, the only point where the derivative is equal to 0. But there is also a point where the derivative doesn't exist. Because we have x to a negative power here, so this equation is the same as 1 equals a negative power is the same as a positive power in the denominator. So this is 1 over x to the third. Okay, so x can't be 0 then because we can't have 0 in the denominator. So our other critical point is where x equals 0. Now we can evaluate the function at these critical points. Plugging 1 into the function, our first critical point, that would give us 2 minus 3, so negative 1. Then plug 0, the other critical point, into the function, and that's just going to give us 0. Then we have to check the endpoints. So let's plug in negative 1, that is the left endpoint. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Negative 1 to the power of 2 thirds is just positive 1, and that's getting multiplied by 3, so it's just minus positive 3. So this is going to be negative 5. And then we could plug 3 in, that is the right endpoint of the interval. So plugging 3 into this function, we get 2 times 3, which is 6, minus 3 multiplied by the third root or the cubed root of 3 squared. And this nasty guy is approximately negative 0.24. So coming down here, we'll put approximately negative 0.24. Now, if this actually happened to be one of the extreme values, I would use the exact value of the number, but using the approximation, we can see that this is in fact not one of the absolute extremes, so I'm fine just throwing the approximation down here. Comparing all these values of the function, we see it has an absolute minimum of negative 5 at x equals negative 1, and it has an absolute maximum of 0 at x equals equals zero. All right, let's move on to our last example. To find the extreme values of f of x equals 2 sine x minus cosine of 2x on the interval from 0 to 2 pi, so a full period 
of sine and cosine. We begin by finding the critical points, so we need to take the derivative of our function. You gotta make sure you know your trig derivatives. The derivative of sine is just cosine, so this becomes 2 times cosine. And then we need a little bit of chain rule over here. We're subtracting the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, and then leave the inside function unchanged, so negative sine of 2x. But then, by the chain rule, we need to multiply by the derivative of the inside function. So negative sine of 2x times 2. And this is equal to 2 cosine of x plus 2 sine of 2x. And there's no value of x where this is not going to exist. Cosine and sine are defined everywhere. So now we just want to figure out at what values of x is this going to equal 0. To solve this equation, it would be helpful if we could factor what we've got on the left. We can, of course, factor out a 2, but that's not really going to do much. Thankfully, we can get a step further by using a double angle identity. We need to remember that sine of 2 times an angle is equal to 2 times sine of the angle times cosine of the angle. So we'll apply that formula here. That's going to give us that 2 times cosine of x plus 2 times sine of 2x is just equal to all of this stuff. So 2 times 2 sine x cosine x. And all of this equals 0. I'm just going to shove our double angle identity off to the side so we have more room here. We could just divide everything by 2, and that's just going to get rid of that and get rid of that. So if we do that, we get cosine x plus 2 sine x cosine x is equal to 0. And now we can factor out a cosine, which is going to help us a lot. Factoring out a cosine, we get cosine times 1 plus 2 sine x is equal to 0. So we want to look at when cosine is 0, and we want to look at when 1 plus 2 sine x is 0. Cosine of x is going to be 0 at x equals pi over 2, and at x equals 3 pi over 2. It is, of course, equal to 0 at infinitely many real numbers, but remember, we're in this interval between 0 and 2 pi, so these are all of the values. You could find this using a calculator, or if you know your unit circle, which you should, then this is pretty easy. Then we set the other factor, 1 plus 2 sine x equal to 0, which means sine x has to equal negative half. And the x values that make that true are x equals 7 pi over 6 and at x equals 11 pi over 6. Now we need to evaluate the function at all of these critical points. These are all of the values that make the derivative 0, so these are the critical points, and evaluate the function at the endpoints of the domain. Evaluating the function at the endpoints of the domain, 0 and 2 pi, as well as all of the critical points we just found, gives us this list of candidates for the absolute extrema. I'm not going to explain all of these calculations because either you know the unit circle and you can do this, or you don't know the unit circle and you can do it on a calculator. But this is what you're going to get. So then, looking for the minimum, we find that our function actually takes on its absolute minimum twice. We have an absolute minimum of negative 3 over 2 at 7 pi over 6 and at 11 pi over 6. So the absolute minimum occurs at two places. Minimum. Make sure I spell it right. And then looking for the maximum, that occurs at pi over 2. So we have an absolute maximum of 3 at pi over 2. And that's how you find the absolute extrema of a function on a closed interval. Begin by finding the critical numbers, which means you need to take the derivative and find where it's zero and where it doesn't exist, and then evaluate the function at all of those critical numbers. Then you also need to evaluate the function at the endpoints. Then look at that list of values for your function. The smallest one is the minimum, or that could happen multiple times, and similar for the maximum. The biggest value is the maximum. Maximum, that also could happen at multiple places. But I hope this video helped you understand the process. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or video requests. Thanks for watching.